It's Thursday, May 28th, 2020, and this is your Social Distanced Daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jar Stays. And on today's show, we dive into the news about the bankruptcy filing at car rental giant Hertz. Auto analyst Michelle Krebs joins Sven to talk about the impact to the auto industry. And Jer speaks with Eater Detroit editor Brenna Hauck about Hopcat shutting down its downtown Royal Oak location. Also, there's news about the Detroit Red Wings and the Ford Wyoming drive-in movie theater. Plus, we offer the latest updates on the COVID-19 numbers from the state and city of Detroit and more. So grab yourself a bowl of cheesy poofs as we do it to it. But first, we need to pay some bills. Daily Detroit is made possible in part by the generosity and support from our members. If you want to become one of them, just head over to patreon.com slash daily Detroit and choose the level of support that best suits you. We're independent media after all, and we do this because we love it. We believe in Detroit, and frankly, no one else would hire us. Help us continue to push Detroit's conversation forward. It makes a huge difference, and thank you. All right, let's do the coronavirus numbers, shall we? It's a grim sort of shuffle that we do here every day. The state of Michigan reported 504 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 68 deaths. That latter figure includes 14 fatalities that were delayed and discovered during searches of vital records. The numbers bring Michigan's total number of coronavirus cases to 55,608 with 5,334 deaths. So, Jer, you uh, once again are the briefing jockey. Uh, what does Mayor Duggan use for uh, to hold these virtual briefings, by the way? Is he on Zoom or Google Hangouts or, or what? Actually, it is a live broadcast on Facebook, which is kind of great. Well, real quick, the percentage of people testing positive for COVID-19 in the city is dropping. A few weeks ago, the positive test rates were nearly 12 percent. But since May 9th, just 4% of Detroit residents have tested positive and 4.7% of suburbanites. And and the suburbanites have access to the test due to their employers. And look, under 5% is a big step across the board. That basically means that about 1 in 25 people in the city have COVID-19, which is much, much better than the situations before. Uh, but, But here's a twist. Mayor Mike Duggan said, We recognize that we're part of a region. It was really important for us to make sure every Detroiter could get tested first. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Detroiters go and visit the suburbs, work in the suburbs, suburbanites work and visit Detroit. We are one region. And unless we beat COVID-19 as a region, we're not really going to wipe it out. And I think that's true. One of the reasons we're not seeing a reopening to the degree of other areas in the state is that the virus has still got a hold of a large part of the burbs. So to help address that, Starting today, anybody in southeastern Michigan can get a free test at the fairgrounds. After all, the reality is that most people who have the virus do not have symptoms. You do need to make an appointment first by calling 313-230-0505. I know I've repeated this number before, but I think it's important people know how to get a test. This is possible because the city can handle up to 1,200 coronavirus tests a day, which is a great number at the Drive Up State Fairgrounds facility that has just become really a uh, shining beacon in the state for learning more about the virus. Jerry, I understand uh, the mayor talked about a couple of uh, non-COVID related stories on today's briefing as well. Yes, Sven. Real quick, the city is recruiting 300 new police officers. And in the light of recent events around George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, high profile recent cases involving the death of African-American residents, Mayor Duggan said that the aim is that these officers be from the Detroit community. The thinking here is that when officers are from and live in the areas they serve, they tend to understand those areas better and react appropriately. And second, there was an update on the Jefferson Chalmers part of town where they've installed a giant tiger dam. That's basically a water-filled barrier. The Detroit River is already up an additional eight inches from last summer, and the dam has been helping with flooding. If... And look, it's it's not the most attractive solution. It's basically like you've got a giant inflatable with water orange ring around that entire neighborhood. It ain't pretty, but it is working. And and these are really high waters. I mean, some of the pictures from last year were insane of roads like Ashland under underwater. And the thing to remember is that Jefferson Chalmers is the lowest land elevation in the city. So you've got, you know, much like Belle Isle, you've got a situation where you've got low land and high waters. But in Jefferson Chalmers, there's a lot of people who live there. Yeah. 
And if this pattern sticks around, it's going to be interesting to see what permanent changes might be necessary because there's starting to be this feeling that since this is such record flooding, that this might be closer to a new normal. So, Sven, yesterday we talked about grants from the state of Michigan's Planet M program to five pilot programs addressing COVID-19 related transportation stuff. I understand Ford now has its own solution. That's right. Ford has rolled out new software for its police interceptor utility vehicle. That's basically the Ford Explorer specced out for police cruiser use with all the bells and whistles that police need. Uh, The aim here is to safeguard officers who have to transport patients when ambulances aren't available or who, you know, transport people who maybe aren't displaying any actual symptoms of coronavirus. Essentially, what this does is it bakes the coronavirus to death by raising the temperature inside the cabin to 133 degrees. Ford uh, goes out of its way to note that that's hotter than Death Valley gets on its hottest days. So obviously that's really uncomfortable. You would do this in between deployments of the vehicle with nobody inside the car and you need the engine running. And the idea here is that by running it for 15 minutes, it's enough to lower the viral concentration and I'm using the technical words because, you know, I'm deferring to experts, by more than 99%. Uh, Ford worked with microbiologists at Ohio State University to vet all this stuff. Well, that is interesting. How does this work? So essentially, the software lets the engine idle at a higher level than it normally does, and then it uses the fan that's already part of the climate control system to transfer the excess heat made by the powertrain into the cabin itself, and it also monitors the time to ensure that it runs for 15 minutes. Now, while it's running, the hazard lights and the tail lights flash in a sequence to signal when the decontamination process has begun, and then they change the sequence to signal when it's done. Uh, You operate this system either with a, a sequence of commands using the cruise control buttons or from a tool that connects to the diagnostics portal, which is underneath the dashboard, depending on how old your police interceptor model is. All right. So if I want to do something like this, can I get the park and bake option? (laughs) Well, Ford, there's no word that Ford plans this for any of its uh, passenger cars. But but I would say I would suggest that park and bake is a fantastic uh, marketing jingle. Maybe we could uh, convince them to use it. But Ford did say they want to develop similar systems for some of their other police vehicle models. I mean, they offer uh, police versions of everything from their F-150 to their transit cargo vans. And Jared, I just have to say, like kind of stepping out, I, I think this is an interesting example of how some of the restrictions that the coronavirus has created have really kind of spurred a lot of innovation in the auto industry. I mean, we talked yesterday about the five grants to, uh, you know, the various pilot programs and everything. And we've also talked on the show about uh, both Ford and GM pivoting and moving really quickly to, you know, pivot to ventilator production and how they, you know, uh, sourced parts really quickly and figured out interesting workarounds to, I think, a process that would normally take you know, weeks or months even to, you know, retool production and everything. And they got this up in a matter of weeks to get, you know, rolling mass producing ventilators. So I, I think that's a really interesting kind of side story uh, to this these challenging times. Let her put you in the driver's seat. Let her take you anywhere at all. Car rental giant Hertz filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection late last week, saying it intends to remain in business by restructuring its roughly $19 billion of debt to emerge as a healthier company. The company said the coronavirus outbreak caused what it called an abrupt decline in the company's revenue and future bookings. Hertz has been in business for more than 100 years and last year bought 1.7 million American cars. Joining us to discuss all this and the impact on the auto industry is Michelle Krebs. She's the executive analyst for Cox Automotive. Michelle, Hertz also owns the car rental brands Dollar and Thrifty. Can you remind us why the company declared bankruptcy in the first place? Hertz was in trouble before all of this happened with the pandemic. It had taken on a lot of debt. There had been some, uh, now looking back, poor management decisions being made about 
you know, what kind of vehicles that they had in their fleets. And so then the travel industry got clobbered when flights stopped and travel stopped and we were all required to stay at home. So their business just tanked. Yeah. Also, haven't they also kind of suffered a little bit from competition from ride hailing businesses like Uber and Lyft? Maybe to some degree, but I certainly think that's just part around the edges. It was more the fundamentals of how, how they ran the business decisions made and then merging all of these car rental agencies and then just some bad decisions and in going into debt, huge amounts of debt. Yeah, $19 billion in debt. That's right. Hertz has already laid off 12,000 employees. They've put thousands more on furlough. And I think a lot of people expect more layoffs to come. But this is also expected to have a huge impact, of course, on the auto industry. Michelle, when I think back a decade or so ago, when GM and Chrysler went into bankruptcy and Ford narrowly avoided it, there was a lot of talk from auto experts that the Detroit automakers needed to become less reliant on sales to rental fleets to be more sustainable. So what's the deal here? They seem to be still dependent on selling to rental fleets. Um, not really. The automakers have definitely scaled way back. The rental car business for automakers isn't particularly profitable. They make some profit, but it's not like what they make with retail customers or commercial customers. So it's always been the least desirable of businesses. And they had been, especially the Detroit 3, had been very heavily dependent on that rental car business. Because if you recall, before the Great Recession, there was something called the Jobs Bank with the UAW, where workers, even if they didn't need, they would put them in a Jobs Bank versus lay them off and keep paying them. And so it was to the benefit of the automakers to just keep the plants running, no matter how much inventory built up. That all changed. The job banks went away. Since the Great Recession, all automakers have done an extremely good job of keep being very disciplined about how much inventory they have. If it, it gets a little too high, they trim production and they have focused on more profitable businesses like retail customers. And, and by the way, after a Great Recession, there are a lot of retail customers out there because of pent up demand. And then also commercial customers and government customers. So it has become less part of the business. The other thing I'll also add is we had anticipated and there had been reporting that Hertz would liquidate under Chapter 7 bankruptcy. That is not what they did. They uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which allows them to continue operating and reorganizing and then reshape the company. Hopefully, they uh, they will come out of that. As we recall, that's Chrysler did that and so did General Motors. So where is the risk then in this bankruptcy filing for the auto industry? If they had liquidated all of their rental car fleets all at the same time and all of the rental car companies had done that, there could be a negative effect. That is not what we're anticipating. If they had done that, it would have flooded the market with a lot of used vehicles at a time when we already have a lot because there hasn't been a lot of movement through auctions or dealerships have been closed and that would have depressed prices. That has shifted. We we did see a lot of used vehicles on the market. Uh, prices plummeted, but now they're starting to move and prices are back up and supplies are going down. So it could have been worse uh, had it been earlier. We do know that all the rental car companies are starting to sell off some of their fleets, but they're not doing it all in the same place. They're not doing it all at the same time. And they're, you know, they understand that if they do it that way, then that depresses the prices and they want money back. Mm -hmm. So do you not see this as a, a big um impact on, on really. the automakers bottom line? No. You know, even though the automakers sell cars to rental car companies, right now they don't have a lot of cars to sell. They're just getting their plants restarted. It's going to take a bit of time to get them back to whatever the new normal <laughs> production, full cup production is because of all the new protocols. They don't have inventory to just plunk into a uh, fleet sale. So I think they're probably glad not to have fleet orders to uh, fill. Those vehicles can now go out to retail customers. Their dealers want more vehicles. Uh, there may be, may be some commercial customers that need vehicles. So those vehicles that they would have sold into rental car fleets will be shifted to other customers. Yeah. So going back to what you were talking about with Hertz planning to, you know, sell a lot of their fleet cars, their used rental cars, as it were, to mm -hmm 
customers on the used car market, that's a little bit of a silver lining for consumers potentially, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm, I, although, you know, I, I think consumers right now think, oh, the auto industry is in desperate shape and I can go get a killer deal. Not so much. I mean, the retail prices haven't gone down all that much. You're not going to get a killer deal probably. But there is a lot of selection. There's There are good deals and uh, there are a lot of used vehicles out there. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good time to buy a used car. The other thing that's going to be happening this summer is that there are 4.1 million leases that are expiring this year. Uh, in the last couple months, as dealerships were closed, they just extended those leases for many customers. So there will be another flood of used vehicles coming onto the market, those off-lease vehicles. So there's going to be a lot of selection and a lot of price ranges and across the board for consumers this summer in the used car market. Yeah, we also talked about before we started recording that there have been a couple other smaller car rental companies that have declared bankruptcy. There may be more to come. Who knows? Uh, do you foresee any problems for people in the future as as things you know go back to quote unquote normal in finding a car to rent? It's hard to say because who knows when we're all going to start traveling again. And when the, when there's a market, there's somehow a way. I do know that the rental car industry is seeking some help from the government, as everybody is, and stimulus money. But I don't know if they'll be successful in getting that. But certainly the travel industry is hurting, and that is uh, a big part of the economy, and the Congress certainly is aware of that. Michelle Krebs, Executive Analyst for Cox Automotive. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you. Joining me on the line is Brenna Hauk from Eater Detroit. Welcome back, Brenna. Hi, happy to be here again. For sure. And we are brought together by a story that has just kind of caught fire online because it involves one of the Michigan brands that people feel a lot of affinity towards, Hopcat. I hear there are some moves happening in Royal Oak. Yeah, so I received a tip on a Tuesday night that Hopcat Royal Oak location would be closing. And as some people may know, uh, Hopcat across the state, across the country, really, because they have several out-of-state locations, closed temporarily in March due to novel coronavirus. And there were a lot of employee layoffs. But the expectation was that those locations would be reopening at a time when it was safe to do so, when it was profitable to do so again. So this closing is is a big deal and it's definitely captivated a lot of people. It's a three-story location, so it's quite a large location. And it was one of the most well-trafficked locations in the Hopcat family of restaurants. Well, the last time we talked, one of the things that I think was clear was that coronavirus is going to change things. And also, you've got situations, I mean, you mentioned dealing with landlords, working with landlords. Seems like this is a landlord dispute. It's not that people weren't coming to it, but the landlord and Hopcat couldn't come to an agreement on what's happening going forward. There's a little bit of a murkiness to that situation. I mean, obviously, if businesses are closed down for a long period of time, then they have to kind of work out something with their landlord. If they don't have a lot of cash on hand, they have to figure out a way to pay landlords. And we don't know exactly what happened with Hopcat here. I only got a statement from Mark Sellers, the founder of Hopcat, and he wasn't willing to talk on the phone. So I only can go on really what I was told by some of my tipsters and it sounds like what happened was that the landlord reacted poorly to the closing of some other locations, which the owner also owns some other Hopkins locations. Maybe hmm. I didn't word that quite right. And they maybe decided that it was just time to sever ties with Hopcat altogether. So that is not confirmed, though. That's just the rumor that I've heard. Mm. But yeah, it, it's a complicated situation. A lot of business owners, not just Hopcat, are having to kind of work with their landlords. Some have worked out deals. I know Bedrock in downtown Detroit has been fairly good with a lot of the business owners down there about giving them breaks on their rent payments for the past two months. And I think going into June as well. But it's probably likely that we'll start seeing more of these closures as landlords, you know, start to call in the rent. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. I think first off, I think some of the conversation online wonders if this is like an indictment of 
downtown Royal Oak. It seems like with the traffic numbers, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like they were doing good business. It sounded like this location was, I don't have the official numbers again, but it sounded to me like this was one of the higher performing Hopcat locations. You know, downtown Royal Oak, it's had some issues. There's been, you know, kind of a narrative that businesses are closing there a lot. But I think overall, downtown Royal Oak is still like a pretty popular place for a lot of people to go and dine out during normal times. And it's still a pretty prominent business district. And especially for bar scenes, like if you want to bar hop, it's a good place to go. There's a lot of businesses in close proximity. It's very walkable. And so it makes sense that Hopcat did well in that location. But of course, with dine-in shutdowns, having a three-story building that you can't serve customers in is going to kind of be crushing. For sure. One last thing before I let you go, there was definitely some talk around, use the verbiage of permanently closed with the Hopcat in Royal Oak. And I wanted to talk about that for a second because although the owner says that they're going to seek a new location, there is nothing at all set in stone with this, not even a hint on where it would be. Yeah, that's correct. By all accounts, it would make sense that they would want to reopen somewhere else in Royal Oak if this was a higher performing location. It would be a huge loss. But again, like everything's up in the air right now. You can say that you want to reopen elsewhere. But, you know, there's no specific timeline or location set for that. So for now, this particular location is closed going forward. Well, and it's just my experience over the years of covering this town is that uh, lots of business owners can tell us lots of different things until we start to see a, you know, a shovel in the ground or a lease signed or something like that. It's right to be a little bit skeptical of those things. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, until you see even even some businesses that, you know, start building don't necessarily always come to fruition. So it's really hard to say. I can only say, you know, what they're telling me and what they're telling me is that this location is closed for now. All those employees are permanently laid off from that location and it's not coming back anytime soon. I can't say for sure if Hopcat Royal Oak will return in a different address, but we'll just have to wait and see. And I know a lot of people are looking forward to seeing. Brenna, thank you so much for your time. And I encourage people to check out Eater Detroit for so many things that are happening and appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here again. Show starts in eight minutes. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. In a quick update to a conversation we had with Karen Dibus about drive-in movie theaters last week, we have word that the historic Ford Wyoming Theater near the border of Dearborn and Detroit plans to start showing films again. They're swinging open the gates on Thursday night with a set of double features that will run into the early morning hours. They say they've done a variety of sanitation measures that they'll run half capacity and you need to stay inside your car to watch a movie. Unless, of course, you've got a truck bed to sit in. Concessions will be available. Adult tickets for the double feature run $11.75 apiece. Children between the ages of 6 to 12 are $4.75 and kids under 5 get in for free. They've got a bunch of info up at FordDriveIn.com and of course we will put that in the show notes. You know, Sven, this story makes me think that I want to own an El Camino. Why's that? Well, I mean, it's the perfect blend of car and truck. You know, you kind of got that nice, like, smooth ride. And then, you know, you've got that huge pack. I feel like pulling into the drive-in theater with an El Camino would be the way to go. All right, before we let you go, there's word from the world of sports that the Detroit Red Wings are likely to bring Jeff Blaschel back as coach for the 2020-2021 season. The news came during a Wednesday Zoom call between Red Wings general manager Steve Eiserman and the media. Blaschel is in his fourth year as head coach and led Detroit to the playoffs only once in his first year. The Red Wings had the NHL's worst record before the season was paused. The league has canceled the remainder of the season. This does make me wistful for the glory days of the Red Wings. I remember that that parade the last time we won the Stanley Cup. We're a long way from that, my friend. And we're done for the day. We appreciate you very much listening to Your Daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll get through this 
together.